So, uh, I'm Brad. I'll be teaching you guys Python. I'm a computer scientist by training. I'm a professional software engineer. So I'll be hanging out and just teaching you guys a little bit of what I know. Uh, how many of you guys have been to HackDC before? Or how many haven't? That's a better question. Cool. So HackDC is a, uh, a 501c3 nonprofit focused on community education, much like KCDC, which is why we like playing with them so much. Um, we have open lab days and things like that so people can come in with ideas or projects and skills they want to learn within various tech fields and we can help you guys out. It's generally super freeform, so if you show up on a Monday night it's going to be hardware and on Thursday night it's going to be software, which is why this is on Thursdays. Um, so you know where we'll be after the class is over when you want to continue programming. Um, yeah, I think that's about all I got. So, are you guys ready to get into some Python? The way I'm going to be doing this class is I'm going to be doing probably a little less than an hour worth of lecture. I'm going to go over some demo code, um, and then I am going to open it up to a workshop, and I'll stay here for an hour, an hour, half later after the class is over to try and help you guys out with whatever you might need help with. Um, I will say right now that I am not a Windows user, so if you have Windows <laughs> issues, we're going to have to figure that out. Um, how many of you all are running Windows? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> and Macs? What do we got? One. We got three Macs? All right. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I suppose I'm the only one running Linux. Yeah. All right, cool. So without further ado, let's get started. Don't judge. I'm trying not to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is going to be an introduction programming class. We're going to be using the Python programming language, and we're going to be using the Pygame library on top of that. Pygame is the super cool thing that allows you to make video games with Python. So it's just a nice way to visualize what you're learning, so you can actually see what's going on and stuff like that. Um, so what we're going to go over today, we're going to try and take it real slow, real easy, because I... How many of you have programmed before? Anyone? And the people who are shaky, is this Code Academy shaky? Is that what's yes. going on? <laughs> yeah? Is that really the case? Cool. Yeah. Um, so how many people did Code Academy? All right. That's good to know. Um, neat. So yeah, we're going to take it real slow. We're going to like start way at the bottom. We're going to talk about what a program is, what computers do, things like that. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any point in time. Um, I'd like this to be informal and kind of fun for everyone. So we're going to go over program, programming language, Python. We're going to show you what um, uh, Python and idle. So if you install uh, Python on a Windows machine, um, it comes with idle, which is a good way to write Python code. Um, if you are running a Mac, I don't think you have it, and you'll need to install it separately. But really, anything you can write plain text into is totally fine. It doesn't matter if it's like Notepad or whatever else, as long as you can write some text in it. Um, cool. So throughout this class, I'll be building a, a Pong game using Pygame. And each one of these classes will be building on the material from the previous class. So this Pong game is going to get more and more refined as time goes on, so you guys can play it by the time you're done with it and hopefully understand what the code is saying. Um, today we will not be covering Pong. I've got a different demo, which is a nice, super easy way to introduce people to programming. So we'll be skipping that today. Um, each class I'll be giving out some demo code and I will be giving out some like helper functions and things depending on what we're doing. I will show you the website for that later on. Uh, there is suggested homework for this class. Don't feel too pressured to actually do it. Um, if you do do it, you're going to get more out of this class. If you don't do it, that's fine too. I don't really care. Um, and then I'll be, yeah, like I said before, I'll be covering a demo. So what is a program? A program is a series of instructions that a computer can execute. Um, the way we write those exit, we write those instructions in as a file, a text file, generally, and uh, that's in human readable form, and we call that source code, right? So when you see like a glob of code, you can generally refer to it as source code. Um, that human readable text gets translated into something a machine can evaluate, 
this ranges in ways it happens from different programming language to different programming language. So a C is going to do that differently than Python. Um, but we don't really need to go very far into that. Um, does anyone have any questions on programs? All right. So a programming language is an artificial language we use to make our computers do things. Um, every computer is capable of doing various instructions and uh, mathematical operations. And our programming languages just allow us to access those functions in a very nice and easy way. Um, languages come in two forms, generally. They are compiled or interpreted. Some are both, if they're really crazy. Um, C is an example of a compiled language where you take your source code, you put that source code through a compiler, and then you get an executable. But only then can you execute the code. Whereas Python is interpreted. So when you write out this text file, you can just tell Python to run that text file. And there's no intermediary step. You just kind of go with it. Um, yeah, that's about it. Any questions there? So is interpreted language, what was the other one? Compiled. Compiled, Compiled and interpreted. What's, what would be the benefit of compiled? Speed. Compiled languages are generally much faster, on the order of like 10 to 100 times faster. Um, they can be even faster than that if you do it right. But it's generally a speed thing. But in this modern age, you don't really need to worry about that. We have stupid fast computers, and they do crazy things. So really, the benefit of using a compiled language over an interpreted language is like. So Java is interpreted. Java. Or a virtual machine. <laughs> it's different. It's different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 What's up? Speed to run. Interpreted languages generally have a faster human time, so it's easier to write in an interpreted language, whereas when you have to write in something that's compiled, it's going to be much more difficult. So there's also that trade-off as well. You don't write a database in an interpreted language. Right. Right. Any other questions on programming languages? Cool. I just picked Python. I think I'm talking about Python now. Yeah. Uh, Python is a cross-platform interpreted programming language, so it'll work on basically anything you got. Um, runs Mac, Windows, Linux, and various other things. Um, it was created by Guido Van Rossum. I hope I'm saying his name right. He is the, um, he self-describes himself as the benevolent dictator of Python. <laughs> so he's the one who runs the project, and he's the one who decides what gets to go into the language. Um, Python is really good for doing things quickly. So if you want to like prototype an idea that you have for an application or something like that, Python is a great way to do that because it's super easy to write, super easy to read, and you can just be on your way really <coughs> quick. And it's a great first language. There isn't like a, a ton of weird syntax you need to learn. It's all like relatively simple and, and straightforward. So we'll be doing that. Any questions about Python? So Python is written. It's written in C. Does it compile? Like, does it get converted into C, or is it just completely different language, different inter like different compiler? Uh, Python is written in C. Right. Um, and if it's over, any of my questions are over. What's up? If they're too complicated, then we'll skip over. All right. Yeah. All right. Yes, I will skip over that okay, then. That's fine, that's fine. <laughs> um, cool. So if you guys are running idle, which I suggest for beginners, it's pretty cool. Um, I'm just going to go be going over different aspects of that IDE. I won't be using it during this class because I don't particularly enjoy it and I'm much faster with other things. Um, so this is great for beginners. It has the Python shell built into it. It's got a place where you can actually write code in it as well. Mac users will have to install this separately. Windows users, when you install Python, it should come with idle. I could be wrong about that. Um, and Linux users, you're on your own. Um, Right, so when you open up idle, it gives you this window, right? This is the Python shell. Right there with the, uh, can I use a mouse cursor? That's uh, right here with the three arrows is where you start typing. You can type whatever you want into this Python interpreter and it will tell you whether or not it's valid Python code. It will error if it is not and uh, it will run the code that you put there. Oh no, I didn't even realize that. Can we? Cool. Is that better? Yeah, More helpful? Awesome.
Um, so if you go to File, New Window when you're in Idle, it will bring up a second window, this one over here, which is untitled, and it's just going to be blank, and you can put text in there. That's going to be your text editor when you're using Idle. So you just type your Python code in there, and from there, you can go to the Run menu and run the module. So if you hit F5, it'll run the module, whatever's in that, um, in that text window. It'll just go ahead and execute in the Python shell and tell you whether or not there are errors. Um, so traditionally, every programming course starts with a small program called Hello World. Um, Hello World is basically where you just print the words Hello World to screen, and that's about it. Um, it's very nice and simple in the case of Python. It's much more complicated in other languages, but right here, our Hello World program is two lines big. We have our first line, x equals hello world, and our second line, print x. All right, we will be, I'm going to cover this in a sec. Right now, actually. So the x in this previous statement right here is a variable, which is basically this bucket where you can store data. Um, I'm going to go over the different data types that exist in Python, the different things you can store in these variables in a little while. Um, hello world is a string. String just means a list of characters. It's how programmers refer to actual words. Um, so the line x equals hello world takes the string hello world and it stores it within x. So anytime you try and like look at x, it will contain the value hello world. Uh, print is a function. Print takes a string as an argument. And uh, when you do print x, x is replaced with hello world, and it just prints it to the screen. Any questions there? That was a little much. So an argument, just for a point of clarification, an argument is values that you would pass to a function. So in math class, you have like the uh, squared is a function you can do to a number. And uh, the argument would be the number that gets squared. Um, is that helpful? Cool. F of x. F of x yeah. is much easier. Yeah. Um, so Python has three primary data types. It has words and letters. These are called strings and characters, respectively. Um, Python makes no distinction between the two. Other languages will. Um, strings are denoted with either double quotes or single quotes around them. As long as the quotes match, it's totally valid. But if they don't match, it's going to give you an error. So if you use double quotes on one side and single quotes on the other, that's going to mess something up. Whereas if you, you know, use double quotes on both sides or single quotes on both sides, you'll be fine. Um, so <coughs> examples of strings would be hello world, c, little c, this is great. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are three different types of numbers you can use in Python. You can use integers, which are whole numbers, counting numbers. So 12 is a good example. 23 is also a good example. Um, there are floating point numbers, which are just decimal numbers. Um, so you can do 2.7 or pi, depending um, on what you're doing. And there are also complex numbers. I, we won't really be covering much about them. I'd just like to let everyone know that they're out there in case you want to do some crazy math. Um, you probably won't want to, <laughs> but they're supported by default. Cool. Do on floating point, uh, on different platforms, do floating point numbers differ as far as like what you do with them? Like precision-wise? Yeah. Uh, no, they should not. That's up to the interpreter. Yeah. Um, the last data type, the last primary data type are Booleans. Um, the name Boolean comes from uh, this field of logic, Boolean logic where you talk about things being true or false and operations on the two. Um, so just know that every time you use true or false, you need to have a capital T or a capital F. If it's lowercase, it will err. Any questions about these? Cool. These primary data types are all things that can be stuffed into variables. Like we stuffed the string hello world into x. You can stuff numbers or booleans or whatever you want into a variable. It doesn't really matter. Cool, I explained most of this already. So uh, single, double, or triple quotes work. I would suggest not using triple quotes. 
Um, <laughs> it's kind of silly. Um, it actually has a special meaning in Python. So later on, I'll talk about that special meaning. I won't right now. Um, but they do work, and they're used for very fun things. Uh, strings can be indexed, meaning if you want the value of a specific character within your string of characters, you can use the square bracket notation to get at it. So in this case, we have the string ABC, and we want the first element in that. And to do that, we would put the square brackets with a zero right behind it. Um, programming languages, computer scientists in general, like to count from the number zero. Um, that's just kind of like the way we do things. It's been that way for a while. There are mathematical reasons for it, but they're really not important. You just got to remember that one is now zero and just go with it. Um, strings can be added together, which is cool. So if you want to do hello plus world, you could stick them together with a plus sign in between them, much like you would add other things. Uh, strings can be multiplied. Um, so <laughs> H4CDC times three is actually the wireless password for HackDC. Um, so it'll just repeat <coughs> H4CDC three times. And that's, you can do that. I've never seen people actually do that for realsies in their code, but it's cool that it exists and it's pretty fun. Um, strings also have a length. So you can do len of ABC and it will tell you how long your string is, how many characters there are. Um, in this case, ABC is three long and len will return three. Questions here? No? Assign, a, assign ABC to X and then get zeroth index of X. So, so if I, so, uh, you wanted me to do what? X times assign ABC. And ABC. And then get the zeroth index of X. Ah, look at that. Everyone get that? Or the first. Or the first. Or the second, Try the <laughs> or the the third, will give you an error. But this is really cool. Negative one will give you the last <laughs> element. Negative two will give you the second to last element, and negative three will give you the third to last element, which is pretty cool. Does that work with like the function as well? Can you be like length of x plus length three if x is minus a b c? Uh. Len x. Do you want to, if you hit the big button on that? Unlocked. Yeah, if you have a. Big button. So there's a bigger button below your finger. <laughs> yeah, the talk button, and then you hit the key button, and that should unlock the door. But he's already gone. Um, yeah, so len of x is equal to 3. Uh, any other questions? Anyone want me to type out some other things? Length of um, slash x zero zero. No. Um, Why is that one? All right. So the next thing I'd like to talk about are numbers. All the regular arithmetic operations work. So you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. There are two other symbols on here which are kind of weird. So the star is for multiplication. Um, the slash is for division. The percent sign is for the remainder of a division, which is fun. So you can do things like figure out the whether or not a uh, number is odd or even checking by checking its remainder. Um, and the star star is power. So if you yes. two star star two, it's going to take two to the second power. Um, so you can do things like one plus one in your Python shell, and that will return two. You can do, uh, is that supposed to be a trick? I don't know. It's been a little while since I've taught this class, so I don't know what that evaluates to. So one times three should be three to the first S power. S three squared. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. So this does equal four. So you remember when you were in a uh, school and they were talking about order of operations and you had that thing, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, you guys remember that? That holds really true in programming languages. So they will always evaluate like left to right. 
Um, so it's a little different. So what this actually evaluates too is um, it'll go left to right. So the first thing it'll do is 1 times 3 squared. I think that's the case. No, divided by I mean, 2. It doesn't value to 4, but I don't know why. It's either 9 divided by 4, which is 4.5, or it's... That's it's why. It's 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 but that's not 4. Exactly. So that's the point. But it's 4.5. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the trick oh, here, well, there's two tricks up. going on here. So one, everything is being evaluated from left to right. So 1 times 3 gets evaluated first. That's a 3. Then we go to the power of 2, which is going to give us a 9, and then we're going to divide that by 2, and that's going to give us a 4. And it gives us a 4 because integers and decimal numbers are treated differently in Python. What's that? From future. 2.7 still has this in it, I believe. And so does it take you do. And you, there's like a special way to get rid of this. You can do a from future import division and that will automatically convert all of your divisions into decimals if you want to do that. Um, but really, it's something to be aware of. If you're going to be using decimal numbers, make sure to put a period behind them or a dot .o. Um, it happens all, yeah. When you're using ints in any language, you're going to get that problem sometimes. But does it take the floor of the remainder? Because it's, it's 4.5, which normally is rounded to 5. It truncates it. It trun just truncates it. It just gets so rid of it. it's the floor, basically. Or, well, the floor of the remainder. Or yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it just gets rid of whatever yeah. decimal part there is. Interesting. Um, your order of operations, you might want to hit on not being too clever. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. The simplest way to do things is generally the best way to do things. Um, so right here we have an integer uh, that is divided by an integer is an integer. And an integer that is divided by a floating point number is a floating point number. And a floating point number divided by an integer is also a floating point number. And a float divided by a float is a float. So the only time you will get an integer out of division is if you divide two integers. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. So we have some Booleans. Um, we have either true or false. They're really great for testing things. Later on, we're going to be talking about things like conditionals and loops. And we'll want to know when things are true or false. So if you're, you know, looping over a certain number of things in a list, for example, and you come to the end of that list, you want to know, are we at the last element? And you can use a Boolean to check whether or not that's true. Um, there are some operations you can do with Booleans They're for comparisons. So in this case, equals equals is a comparison operator, and it's trying to see whether or not true is equal to true. That is going to evaluate to true. And if we have true is equal to false, that evaluates to false. Does that make sense? Well, yeah? sort of try true equals equals 1, or true equals equals 0. Uh, true equals 0. That is false. True equals 1. Also, no, it's true. Oh, that's true. Uh, all right. So if we do a 0 here, right. we get a false. That works. You can also do things like not equal. So the the uh, bang means not. So you can do that. Or if you do not false. Oh, it doesn't like that. Right. It likes that because Python likes words. Um, you can do uh, number comparisons. 5 is less than or equal to 4. That's false. Uh, greater than 4 is true. Greater than or equal to 4. Yeah, so you can do all sorts of numerical comparisons like that as well. So if we want to do len of x is less than 4, you can do that too. Cool. Here are the logical expressions. Um, so all of these operators here will evaluate to either true or false. The logical operators are and, or, not, is, in, equals, not equal to, 
uh, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, less than or greater than. Those are all the things that you can do. Um, What's up? You ever use in? Yeah. In? Yeah, you do. You'll use it f a lot for lists, which we're not going to talk about right now. Okay. And, or, not, and is. Is is something that you probably will never use, so you can just forget about it right now. But it does exist, and it does something important. It will check to see if two things are completely identical. If they are the same thing, it will evaluate to true. If they are not the same thing, then it will evaluate to false. We'll talk about more. Exactly, exactly. So it's actually comparing the bucket itself rather than what's in the bucket, right? Which makes things a little confusing. We'll talk more about is when we talk about objects, which will probably be the last class that we're doing here. Um, yeah, so and is true only if both things that you're comparing are true, right? So if we do true and false, that evaluates to false. If we do true or false, that evaluates to true. What else do we have? We have a not false, which just gives you the opposite of whatever it was you had. And yeah, I'm going to skip in for now. And we saw numerical ones before. You can chain these together. So you do not false and true is true. Again, it's evaluating. What's up? That is oh, or. And yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And. Yeah, so and is an operator, right? Much like a plus sign. So you just stick and in front or in the middle of two values, and it will see if both sides are both true. Okay. Does that help or hurt? Yes. All right. So why does not true and false false? Not true and false. Right, yeah, it should yeah. Be false and false, which is which is false. You're right. No, I guess you're right. It's false. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I thought like I misspoke. So I, yeah. as long as both <laughs> sides are true and will evaluate to true, if there is any false anywhere within there, it's going to evaluate to false. I see. Or requires any true on either side. If there's a true, it will evaluate to true. Uh, not again, just flips whatever the value is from true to false or from false to true. All right, now that I messed that up, we good? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. XOR is numerical, and you can do it in Python, okay. but um, there is no logical, yeah, there is no logical XOR. Um, right. So we have a couple more examples that, oh, I have an in example here. So the last example on this is, uh, is A, in ABC, and it will just check to see if the character A is contained within the string ABC. And in this case, it is, and it will evaluate to true. Cool. So there's a couple of class resources for this. Um, the slides, the sample code, and some useful links are going to be on our wiki page. The mailing list that we have on this slide is actually outdated. Um, we have a new one. I don't remember what it is. For the next class, I will bring it. Um, so I can hand that out to you guys. That list will be used for you guys to get in contact with me and with each other. So if any of you have questions, please post to that list so I can answer your question so everyone knows the answer as opposed to, you know, just you, which is always fun. Um, so I'll be monitoring that closely just to make sure all of you can get the most out of this class. Cool. So there's one more page. Uh, is everyone copying this down or are they not? I'm All right, cool. So I'll leave that up for a sec. There's one additional website which is not on this uh, class resources page. Uh, the code that is linked to the wiki at the moment is undownloadable, which is a hassle. So we need to go ahead and fix that, but it's stored elsewhere online. So I'm going to go ahead and show you guys where you can download the sample code. So you guys let me know when you're, when you're good and ready for me to show you that other website. We good? Cool. All right, so this is the other website. 
github.com slash three laws safe, that's me, slash hack DC intro to programming. On this page, there will be a zip button right over here. You can click that and it'll download all of the presentations from the class, all of the demo code, and all of the source code for the class. So if you feel like going ahead or you feel like you didn't quite get something that was in the slides, they're all going to be contained there. And class five is something that I'm not going to be covering for this this iteration of this course. Um, it was also poorly thought out, so you can go ahead and skip that one. But the rest of it is going to be valuable information. Um, yeah. So I'll give you guys another sec to get there. Maybe download the zip if you'd like. Actually, I'd suggest downloading the zip if you've got your computers out now and Python already installed. How big is the file? Tiny. It's a bunch of text. Yeah. So let me know when you guys go ahead and uh, get that website up and some stuff downloaded, then I can just go over the demo code for today, which is really cute. Yeah, this is we're in class zero. So we're in class zero. Computer scientists, we like the number zero. Just trying to reinforce that. You guys just let me know when you want me to go. Uh, what was the other site on the second one on the slide? The second one on the slide was an address to a mailing list, okay. which is wrong. Oh, wrong. So You're don't right. worry about that one right now. Do you have the right mailing list address? Three law safe. How do we get there? Just type in the URL. Type in the URL. Oh, yeah. deal with it. So the top of the page right next to yeah, right her. We doing good? Everyone got it downloaded and unzipped? Cool. Then I'm going to cover our sample code for today. Let's uh, see what it does first. Python turtle demo. And then I'll just go over all the code that's within this. This is a super simple first example. So turtle graphics were something that was used in the 80s in order to teach people to start, how to start programming. And the I basic idea is you have a turtle, and this turtle has a pen in its hand, and it can wander around a paper and drag the pen around. So you can draw cute little pictures with turtle graphics, which is fun. And that's exactly what this does. So we open it, and it just draws a little house. Or a gnome with a square face. Yep, one more time, just because it's fun. Right? So it moves to the left of the screen, and it goes up and draws a triangle, it comes down and draws a square. Relatively simple. This is not Pygame. This has nothing to do with Pygame. This is actually built into Python. Um, there's uh, two Python files you'll find in the class zero folder. There's going to be one that's called wrapper turtle, which is just full of convenience functions, because I didn't want you guys to have to worry about objects yet. Um, we'll talk more about what's actually going on in that file later. And then there's the uh, turtle demo file. So if we open the turtle demo file, we can see some actual Python code. So up at the top, we have this line from wrapper turtle import star. What that means is that it means that we're importing all of the functions that are defined in wrapper turtle into this file that we're using. So we're basically. Um, so we have these functions, which I'm going to talk about later in a different class. Forward, backwards, left, right, pen up, pen down. Um, all of these things after this from line are available to you within this file. When you execute this code, you need to make sure that wrapper turtle and whatever code, the demo code in this case, need to be in the same folder. 
or they won't execute properly. We have, uh, right, so for instance, I've got this class zero. Yeah. What do I do? What do you do? Yeah. Uh, I can open it with. Yeah, you can open it with idle. So you right click and open. Well, yeah. if I open it, this is what happens. Nothing. Just open and close. Well, go into the TK window and open it. Um, so I'm going to run through this code really quick, and then I'll help people with issues that may come up. All right, so we see the first, so all lines that start with a pound sign, those are not evaluated by Python. So you can put pound in whatever you want after that, just to like let your, remind yourself of what you're doing or get rid of code that you don't want to do, things like that. It'll never evaluate what's after a pound sign, ever. Those are called comments. So the first actual thing that we're doing is we're pulling the pen up. We're changing the turtle's orientation. We're moving it right 90 degrees. Then we're moving forward 100 units. We're turning left 90 degrees. We're moving backwards 200. That seems a little silly. And we're putting the pen down, and then we're ready to draw. Right? So when your pen is up, and you are moving around, you will not be drawing a line. When your pen is down and you're moving around, you will be drawing a line. So once your pen is down, we move forward 100, we turn left 90, we move forward another 100, and this is going to be the floor and the right wall. For the roof, we turn left 30 degrees, we move 100 up, we turn left 120 degrees, then we move forward another 100. We'll turn left 30 degrees again, move another 100 forward, and then uh, fix the roof. And then the done call, just make sure the screen stays up after it's over. So if we didn't have done, it would just draw this little house and the screen would close. And that's no fun. You want to admire your artwork. So the done call just makes it permanent. So let's run it again, just for giggles. There you go. There's your little house. You guys kind of see what's going on in terms of like execution? Can you see some of the code there? You see it like moving backwards and stuff? I wish I could slow it down. There's no way to do that. Yeah, I was about to ask about that. Yeah, you can't slow it down, which is a bummer. But yeah. So the homework for class number zero is to use this turtle graphics program to draw yourself a pretty picture. And then, uh, yeah. Other than that, I am done with my lecture portion for today, a bit early. Uh, I'd like to help you guys make sure you know how to run this code so you can play with it when you're at home or whatever. And uh, other than that, you guys are all free to go, and I will see you next Thursday. Thank you. Of course. Okay. What's up? Not being clever. I think that helps the hell out of comments. Because you'll look at code that you wrote three months from now, and you'll just be amazed. You'll look at code you One wrote six months from now, and right. you'll be really amazed. Yeah, no problems. Yeah, that's a super good point. It's really important to comment your work because there are so many times I've returned to code that I just have no idea what it does anymore and it's really unfortunate. <laughs>